but the Lord is really moving, and I'm not going to share everything He has shared with me, but I actually feel this morning specifically to share just, I, I want us to do a little bit of a Bible study this morning, okay? So I want you to turn to the book of Colossians. So, so I want us to, you know, one of our leaders actually challenged or asked me to maybe go through more, and I didn't, I planned this, and then when, when, when the person said this, I was like, okay, this is so cool, because the Lord really wants us to be equipped in the Word this year. He wants us to delve into the Word of God. He wants us to become more, you know, like grounded and, and rooted in the Word of God. And so I want us to, I, I want to challenge you and, and hopefully inspire you this morning to, to do a bit of a study and to how to study the Bible, how to read the Bible, like, like the book of Colossians, okay? So I believe that God wants us to be like the Kocha Dam, okay? Anyone, I didn't get to put a picture up, okay? But remember when the Kocha Dam overflowed last year? Anyone remember that miracle where it was like so low, 30% or whatever, and then there was that overflow? Anyone see the video or the pictures of the Kocha Dam overflowing? If you didn't, go into Facebook. But it's a beautiful, or, or to just search Kocha Dam overflowing, you'll get a lot of videos and pictures. But how amazing was that? Who, who saw that a video or a picture of the Kocha overflowing? Just raise your hand, anyone? But remember, if you did see it, how beautiful it was that when that dam overflowed, right? That water just gushing over the, the walls, which were dry for so long, and like it was just abundance, amen? So I believe that God wants us to be like the Kocha Dam in 2024, that he wants us to overflow. Amen? Who, who wants to overflow in 2024? Okay, so I'm going to give us a few keys out of, out of Colossians when, when, well, for us to overflow. Because you see, if we, if we live in survival or we live in lack, we, we will struggle. Okay? When we live from empty, we will struggle. We just survive. We just get through the day. We get through the year. God doesn't want us just to live from empty because that leads to burnout, it leads to fatigue. God wants us to live from an overflow this year, amen? And when you live from an overflow, you've always got more to give. You've always got more money, you've always got more time, you've always got more um, to give other people and you've got lots to live from because God wants to bless us. So if you're overflowing, you will be so full yourself but you'll always have enough to give others. So I believe this year is gonna be the year where God wants us to overflow as individuals and as a church, okay? Because that leads to fruitfulness, it leads to growth, it leads to blessing, okay? Last year was a year of pruning. Remember at the end of the year I shared, it felt to me like a year of pruning for us as a church. And I believe what happens after pruning? Anyone know what happens after a branch is pruned? You? You grow. That's the reason God prunes us. And so I believe it's a year of growing, a year of fruitfulness, a year of blessing this year, a year of overflowing, okay? And so we built a puzzle this holiday. So we went to St. Francis for a week and we bought a nice puzzle and we built this puzzle. And so beautiful when all the puzzle pieces fit together at the end, okay? It was quite a challenging puzzle. It took us more than a week. We had to bring the puzzle home. We didn't finish it in that week. So we were like, okay, we've got to finish this puzzle at home. And we did. And it was so beautiful seeing that puzzle completed. And so I believe these key points out of Colossians are like a puzzle piece fitting together. All of them fit together in their place. And when you, when you put all the pieces together, they build this beautiful puzzle and they make such a beautiful view. It's awesome to look at it. But when a puzzle's half built, it's like, oh, you almost want to give up or you, you know, the pieces don't look right or they don't fit together. It's not nice. But when everyone, everything fits together, it is beautiful. And these pieces of this puzzle, for, and it's only four things I'm going to share. There's many more, obviously. But I believe if we can put these pieces together and make them fit into one beautiful puzzle, it will help us to overflow this year, okay? So let's read together from Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 to 12. I'm going to read all four verses, and then we're just going to go through four things that I believe will help us to overflow this year. But I'm going to refer to the whole book of Colossians. So if you've got a physical Bible here, yeah, it will help you because you know, you can, you can actually look through it yourself. Because I want to show you how to read the Bible better, how to get more revelation out of the Word of God, okay? Who wants to get more revelation out of the Word of God this year? Okay? I trust that you're hungry for it and that this will equip you and excite you for this year. So Paul writes to the Colossians. Now, background to the Colossians, they were a blessed church, but what happened was some things started to creep in. There was Weird stuff like legalism and mysticism and people try to say the body is sinful, but the spirit is, you know, they try to live as 
all, all, all spiritual stuff is good and all physical stuff is bad. So they were trying to save themselves. They were trying to live a better life through other things and not the gospel itself. And so Paul writes to these guys and, and, he's, and he's challenging them a little bit. He's, he's, he's saying that you're, you're a blessed church, but just watch out for certain things, okay? Which is like Paul's, most of his letters he wrote to either rebuke or correct or warn or or admonish the church in certain ways, okay? Ephesians is pretty much just a book of who the church is and who we're supposed to be as believers. It wasn't really a book of correction. It was just a book that was written actually to encourage the church. So Ephesians wasn't really a a corrective book, but Colossians, in a way, Paul is trying to correct just some things that have crept into this church. And he had never been to this church. He had never seen the people. It was planted by, by one of his disciples, and so he really longed to be with them. But he starts by by doing this, by saying this, and I believe if we can apply these things to our lives, I believe we're going to be blessed this year, okay? So let's read together what he starts to write to the Colossians. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, now that that reason is, is the gospel, the fact that they had become believers, that they were walking with the Lord, they were following the Lord, and so I believe it's the same with us. We have been following the Lord, we know Him, we we, we love Him, and we're walking in His ways And he says, for this reason, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask. So now he starts what I'm going to pray for you guys. He says, I'm going to ask the following, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Doesn't that sound like abundance, overflow. I pray that you will, you will increase, you will, you will be filled, you will be full. Then he says, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. That is like an introduction to this book of Colossians, okay? So just a tip before I go through point number one. When we read the Bible, we must look at the the, the start as a little bit of a summary of what the rest of the book is going to be about, okay? So good theology, as as Rudy will know, is when, when, when you start reading a book, you must find the keys to what Paul is trying to say throughout the whole book, okay? So this first part here gives a clue as to what is Paul going to write about. He's going to, he's making a little bit of a summary of his book, okay? So these, these um, four verses give a good clue as to, as to what Paul wants to say. So he gives, he says, I pray for you for these things, but what he's also doing is he's saying, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about these things, okay? So the first thing he says is, and I believe this is a number one key for us to flourish and to overflow and to be blessed in 2024. He says, I'm going to pray this for you. This is the first thing I pray for you. And this is the first piece of the puzzle. This is crucial because if you don't get this right, the rest kind of are just random, right? This, this is almost like the outside of the puzzle. It's, it's so crucial to have this. Otherwise, the puzzle won't make sense. He says, I, I pray that you may be filled with what? The knowledge of the will of God. Now, these guys were seeking a lot of other knowledge. They were seeking secret knowledge, weird stuff like mysticism and visions and all of this stuff. And he says, listen here, there's one knowledge that you need to know. There's a certain knowledge that you need to know, and that is the will of God. I want you to be filled with His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And so I want to ask you this morning, are you filled with the knowledge of God's will for this year? Do you know what God's will is for this year? Do you know what God's will is for your life? Do you know? And Paul says, I want you, I'm really praying, I'm interceding for you to know the will of God. That is why he's praying for them, because he says, if you don't know the will of God, you're going to walk around confused, you're going to walk around uncertain, you're going to walk around looking for a lot of other things to try and fill you. So so what is the will of God? Anyone want to give a, give a shout out. What, what is the will of God? What would you say is the will of God? Generally, now not for you, what is the will of God? Guys, thought about it a bit. Think about it. You don't have to say anything. You might feel, oh, shucks, I'm going to be wrong. 
The will of God, I believe, in one word, a simple word, is the gospel. Okay. The gospel is the will of God. Say the gospel. So the, the general will of God, and I want to apply it now to your life. Okay. So to know the will of God, you need to know the gospel. That is the will of God, that you may be filled with the knowledge of the will of God, filled with the gospel, okay? What is the gospel? Four things. The gospel is God, man, Jesus Christ, and a response. That's a way to remember the gospel. It's God, a holy God, a perfect God, a creator God, an awesome God, a father. Then there's mankind, who he created, but there's a massive gap between God and man. Okay, so without man, there wouldn't be a gospel needed. Everyone agree. If it was just God, why would we need a gospel? But the gospel is needed because there's God and there's man, sinful man, fallen man, weird man. You look in the world and you see, wow, people are broken, right? The world is broken. So the gospel has four aspects, God, man, and then the third aspect is almost the central aspect of the gospel, and we've been singing about him all morning so far. His name is Jesus Christ. Christ the Lord, he's Lord of all. He's the Savior. He's the one to bridge the gap between God and man. And it's all about him. And what Paul is writing to these Colossians, read the first two chapters, you will see he says, Christ is all in all. No other knowledge is needed. No legalism is needed. No mysticism is needed. It is Christ is all in all and he fills all in all. The third aspect of the gospel. And then the fourth aspect is a response. The gospel demands a response. People have to respond to the gospel. Okay? So if you can know the gospel, it's just those four aspects. God, man, Jesus Christ himself, and then a response. And that response is by faith. When we receive him, we believe in him, and we repent of our sin, and we respond in faith and, and confession. Paul writes in, in, in verse 19 of chapter 1, you can read it, he says, It pleased the Father that in him, Jesus Christ, all the fullness should dwell. Say, all the fullness should dwell. And then again in chapter 2, verse 9, he says, For in him Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus Christ dwells all the fullness of God. And so he's saying to these guys, he says, Guys, you don't need to add stuff. You don't need to try to get yourself saved, try to get yourself into heaven, or try to become a better person. It is Christ who's all in all. He's your Savior, but he's also your sanctifier. He's all you need. Nothing else is needed. For in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwells. And he came in bodily form. He came physically on this earth to show us how to live. And so the will of God is the gospel itself. It's not self-made rules. It's not discipline of the body. Because that's not going to help you to overcome the sin and the, you know, the, the challenges. It's not secret knowledge. But it's Jesus Christ himself. You see, there are a lot of other wills going into this year. If you think of this year, what, what, what is your will for this year? You probably have a will for this year. You've probably got dreams and hopes, and it's not wrong. But, but is the will of God going into this year? Do we know the will of God, and do we live the will of God? So the will of God is that, that we truly know Him. His will is that we, first of all, know His will. And so I wrote this down. This is not anyone else. You can quote Alistair King, will you? Okay, so I wrote this. To know His will, we must know Him, right? To know Him, we must know His Word. To know His Word, we must live by His Spirit. And to live by His Spirit, we must follow Him together. Yeah, I'll repeat it again. Sorry, I didn't put it on the PowerPoint. To know his will, we must know him. That's the first part. Because he wants us to know his will. Paul writes here, he says, I don't want you to know him, although Paul is meaning we must know him. He says, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of the will of God. That I pray for you. But I believe in order to know his will, we must know him. So how do you know him? To know him, we must know his 
word. And that's why I'm doing this this morning, that we can go through this one book and see how much revelation there is in just one book of the Bible. There's lots of revelation all over the Bible. But there's revelation in one word in the Bible, in one scripture. And then to know his word, we must live by his spirit. Because the spirit has to reveal to us the word of God. And then I said, to know to, to live by His Spirit, we must follow Him together. You need community. We need to follow Jesus together, and that's the blessing of church. So in order to know the will of God, what, what is needed? The Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the people of God. It's called discipleship. That's how we follow Jesus together, His Word, His Spirit, and His people. And out of that, we're going to know the will of God for our lives. That's how I found the will of God for my life. I was called to be a pastor through Shofar Church. It just happened to be Shofar. It happened to be a group of people that inspired me in these three things, to love His Word, read it, study it, grow in it, to full, be filled with His Spirit, and then to grow in relationships. And I was inspired and called by God to go into the ministry. That's how I knew the will of God for my life. And so I want to ask you this morning, what is God's will for you to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ? His will is that the gospel goes out. His will is that you live the gospel and that you preach the gospel. So how are you going to do it this year? You have been called to be at a workplace, amen. You have been called to be part of a club, part of a sport or part of a hobby that you do. You have been called in a specific place. So how do you live the gospel in that place? That is the will of God for your life for this year. It's very simple. Sometimes we set these, may, these goals and strategies and all that, and yes, it's not bad. But live out the will. Know the will of God generally, but know the will of God for your life. You can make a difference there where you are. Your complex, your place of, of living, your, your home, your suburb. Colossians 1.27, read a little bit further down in, in verse 27 of chapter 1. It says, to them God willed to make known. What? He wanted to make known the gospel, the mystery of the kingdom, the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, not only the Jews, the Gentiles needed to hear the gospel as well. And what is that good news? What is that mystery? Christ in us, church. Hallelujah. That's the gospel, Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's where God made man one with him through Jesus Christ because he responded, because he believed, because he followed said yes. Those four aspects of the gospel became Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's God himself living in us by his spirit, and that gives hope to the world. So tell somebody next to you, you are the hope of the world. But it's you with Christ, amen, because you're very hopeless without Christ. Let's be honest, okay? All of us are hopeless without Christ. We just bring hopelessness. But with Christ, we are the hope of the world. But it's you. Jesus wants to work through you. Amen, in 2024. So that is to know his will. So do you know the will of God for your life, the hope of glory, Christ in you? But it's all about Christ. Don't add stuff to Christ. Don't try to be legalistic. Don't try to talk about the new moons and the Sabbaths and all of these things. Read chapter two of Colossians. He says, it's not about festivals and trying to keep this law. And he said, Christ is, is all and in all. It's all about him, Amen. And don't we live in a world of confusion and a world where people are trying to go back to keeping the law. People are trying to exactly what the Colossians were experiencing. People are trying to do church in a specific way, in this way. There is so much confusion. Is this right? Is this wrong? It's all about Jesus Christ. Amen. Then the second thing, the second puzzle piece that will help you this year to flow and flourish and, and be abundance, have abundance of life is that you walk worthy of him. So you need to know his will. And if you do know his will, guess what? You're going to walk worthy of him. He said, I pray that as you know the will of God, that you may also walk worthy of him. Then he goes, fully pleasing him. And he carries on, he says, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. A lot of stuff in there. It could be four different points, but I sum it up into this point. Walk worthy of this amazing Jesus. That is all in all, that fills all in all, that is the Alpha and the Omega. 
Colossians 2, verse 6. Go to, go to chapter 2 and verse 6. It says, I'm just highlighting a few verses that, that go back to what Paul said at the beginning. He says, as you have received Christ, so walk in him. There that word walk comes again. So he's carrying on with his pattern of walk. And what does the word walk in the New King James Version mean? It simply means to live in Christ. Because when we live, we walk. Who walks a lot in your life? All of us walk a lot, right? <laughs> you don't sit still your whole life. You walk around. You sleep a bit. You run a bit. You do other things. But mostly what we're doing is walking. These new Garmin watches measure your steps of a day. Some people are doing like 12 to 15 to 20,000 steps in a day, especially if you run. But most of us will do quite a few steps in a day, even if you don't run. You'll probably do at least 5,000 steps in a day. So what does it mean to walk? It means to live. That's how we're living. We're walking a lot. We are living. We're moving. We are walking in Jesus Christ. And he says, walk worthy of him. So chapter, go, go on to chapter 3. What does verse 1 of chapter 3 say? If you were raised with Christ. So he's in, in, the, in, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, Paul is writing and he says, this is what Christ has done. Chapter 3 and, he, and 4, he says, this is what Christians should do. Chapter 1 and 2, what Christ has done. Chapter 3 and 4, what Christians should do. So he starts there and he says, if you have been raised with Christ, in others, if you have said yes to the gospel, if you are living the gospel, if you believe the stuff, if you've made Jesus your number one, then you need to do this. You need to seek those things which are above. So how can we work, walk worthy of Jesus? We need to seek those things which are above. He carries on, he says, if you have died with Christ, put to death the things of the flesh in which you once walked again before you were saved. So what did we, what did we do before we were saved? We walked in a certain way, in the lusts of the flesh, in anger, in all of these things. He mentions a few there. But now you're walking in a new way. You're walking in Christ. You're living in Christ. You're seeing Christ in a different way. You're seeing your life in a different way. You have died with Christ. You have been raised up with him. So walk this way. Live this way. So how can we walk worthy of him? We need to put off the things of the flesh. We need to put off anger, he says. Wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, lying to one another. He says put off all of these things. But put on the following. Further down in, in chapter 3, you can look on. He says, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, forgiveness, love, and peace. Walk in the fullness of the Spirit. Walk in the fruits of the Spirit. He doesn't mention it there, but he refers to it. The fruits of the Spirit. Walk in these things. And then he goes on and he says, let the Word of God dwell in you richly. Isn't that beautiful? I'm trying to sum up this whole chapter now, so I'm not focusing on one or two verses. I'm trying to sum up the chapter as he's telling these people how to obey what he has prayed for at the beginning, how to be filled with the knowledge of God and to walk worthy of him. He says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. And then he says, teaching and admonishing one another. So I've got a little challenge for all of us this year. Who are you going to teach this year? Who are you going to warn? Admonish means just to warn or to, 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 to gently rebuke at times, to correct, to caution, to encourage. It, it has a sense of encouragement. But who are you going to teach and admonish this year? And who is teaching and admonishing you? All of you, I believe, are hungry. You are being taught. You are hungry to, to be taught. I believe you guys are at a good place. You are receiving. Especially if you come to church, you're receiving. If you come to the, the encounters, and, and you equip yourself, you're receiving. But who are you going to teach? He doesn't say all the pastors must teach, all the ministry people must teach. He says teaching and admonishing who? One another. So a little challenge for all of us this year. Who are you going to equip? Who are you going to disciple this year? Because we can keep being discipled, we can keep receiving, but you know how you're going to grow and increase in the knowledge of God? When you teach. That's why we are blessed as pastors, as ministers. We get to do this as a job. It's such a blessing. I grow in the Lord because I, I teach the Word, and it really helps me to grow, and it challenges me to grow because I can easily stagnate as well. But I say, God, I need revelation. Every Sunday, I need revelation. 
But I don't want this just for myself. I want to give it to you guys. I want to say, hey, the word of God is going to equip us so beautifully when we teach one another. Because you can receive only a certain amount. But when you have to teach someone else, you make sure you know and live what you're teaching, right? Because it's easy to just sit and make a few notes and then just carry on for the next Sunday. But are you going to equip some people at work? What about doing a Bible study at work? What about, you know, starting to pray for people and just share the Word of God? Little bits, little bits, little bits. Rudy shared with me a video yesterday about a guy getting baptized there at the beachfront on their outreach. They do every Saturday. But I mean, you know, I can see the fire and their passion in Rudy's life because he is reaching out. He's telling someone else about the gospel. But if you're just receiving the gospel and you're not telling someone else about it, you can only grow to a certain degree. Amen. You will only flourish to a certain degree. You will flourish because you're planted in the word, you're in community. But you know where you flourish the most? It's where you admonish and teach other people. So he says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. And I believe some of us need to say, you know what, Lord, I'm, I'm so full. You can't pour more into me. I need to give out that you can pour more in. And so, and so walk worthy of him, fully pleasing him, being fruitful. He says, be fruitful in all good works. That's how we become fruitful when we give out. And then he goes on, he says, whatever you do in word or in deed, do in the name of the Lord. That fully pleases God, church. When we do everything in the name of God, whether we say, do, think stuff, if, we, if we're not doing it in the name of the Lord, it's not pleasing him. So do it all in the name of the Lord. And when you want to get angry, you like think, oh, is this in the name of the Lord? Whoa, I better not get angry now. When I want to, you know, skin it about this person, gossip about that person, oof, is this doing it in the name of the Lord? Yeah, I think it's glorifying God. And he says, do all in the name of the Lord. And then he goes on. How do, how do we walk worthy of the Lord? How do we please him? He says to wives, submit unto your husbands. Yeah, he's talking about relationships. So he says, you've got a new person in you. You made new, you've got a new character, you live in the fruits of the Spirit. But then he says, okay, let's talk about relationships now. Number one relationship in God's heart is marriage. So wives, submit unto your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Servants, obey and submit unto your masters. And masters, don't abuse and misuse your servants. Treat them well. He's talking about relationships. And I believe he's not only meaning those relationships, I believe he means all relationships. Let's dwell with each other in love. Amen. That's how you please the Lord, is when you honor people. You, you live in relationship with people in love, and some are difficult. Some, some relationships in 2024 are going to be challenged. You just watch the space, okay? They will be challenged because People are sinful. All of us need Jesus. Even other believers need Jesus very much. I mean, even I need Jesus this year. So give me some grace. Give your leaders some grace. People will get cross at times. People will be stressed and challenged and under pressure. So don't take offense so easily. Amen. So how do we please God? He says, continue earnestly in prayer. Chapter 4, verse 2. He finishes this relationship talk and he says, continue earnestly in prayer. Being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Prayer pleases God. Speaking to God pleases him. Connecting with him pleases him. But why is he saying this? He says, guys, pray for me that the gospel would spread. He did it in Ephesians as well. At the end of the putting on the full armor of God, Paul spoke to the Ephesians. He says, please pray for me for open doors. Pray for me for every opportunity to preach the gospel. And I think he said that to challenge them as well to preach the gospel. Because if you're praying for other people to preach the gospel, you are so convicted for yourself, right? You can't just pray for others to preach. You realize, flip, Lord, you've called me also to preach the gospel. I must also pray for an open door for my life. So he says, pray that the gospel would spread. That pleases God. And then use that open door. Then he says, walk in wisdom. Among those who don't believe, walk in, in wisdom among the unbelievers, but make the most of every opportunity. Trust God for divine appointments. Trust God that you can bear fruit in your life in 2024. So walk in wisdom, walk in grace, have, have so much compassion and grace for the unbelievers, but, but trust the Lord to speak to them. Trust the Lord that they would change. And that is how we walk worthy 
of the Lord. That is how we fully please Him. That is how we are fruitful in every good work. And that is how we increase in the knowledge of God when we just do what Paul has written throughout the, the book of Colossians. Number three, and this is just quick. He says here, I want you to be strengthened with His might according to His glorious power. Be strengthened with might according to His glorious power. And I believe Paul is talking here about being filled with the Holy Spirit. All the others also need to be, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But he says, yeah, guys, I'm praying for you to really have strength beyond your ability. We have the power of the Holy Spirit, guys, to lead us this year. Amen. And his power is unlimited. His power is incredible. His power is so amazing. It gives us might. It gives us power to do miracles, power to overcome, power to live in the fruit of, of the Spirit. As I said in the Christmas service, He is not only God who saves us, but He is God who's with us. He wants to be with you. So don't receive Him just for His power and to do stuff through your life. Receive Him because He wants to dwell with you. That is His power. But I believe He's saying, be, be filled with the power of God, especially for two things or three things. To have patience, number one. Who, 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 who's a very patient person here? Some people believe they are patient, okay? But most of us don't believe we're so patient, right? Generally, people are impatient. But God is the most patient of all people, right? He's long-suffering and he's patient. So all of us can grow in patience. Even the most patient people need more patience. And your patience will be tested this year. Those of you who raised your hands, I guarantee your patience will be tested this year. The rest of us, same. Your patience will be tested. He says, I want you to be patient and long-suffering. Why? Because he's writing to a group of people that were very much in the minority. They were persecuted for their faith. Christians in that time were persecuted. And he says, listen here, guys, it's not easy to be a Christian in this world. And you think it's gotten easier in the year 2000 and 24? No. There's probably Christianity is growing, but there's more resistance to Christianity. And he says, yeah, listen here, even if you're killed for your, your, your faith, just be long-suffering. Suffer long. If you have to suffer, suffer long. Because there's, there's a place for patience, but there's a place for when you suffer long. It's not easy. 2024 won't be easy. I can guarantee you that. It's going to be an amazing year, but it's not going to be an easy year. Jesus said, you're not going to have an easy life, but I've overcome this world. But especially he's talking here about persecution. And so we in South Africa don't really know much about persecution. But I can tell you it, it, it could come in different ways. The gospel is not popular. So for you to live the gospel, to live in pleasing God, to live in bearing fruit, it's not going to be easy. The world does not accept the gospel easily. And then he says, I want you to have joy. You, 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 you must be strengthened with me so that you can have joy in all circumstances. And who knows, the Bible says, what is the strength of, of our lives? What is our strength as believers? It's called joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So the fruit of the Holy Spirit, one of the fruits is, is patience and another fruit is joy. Being filled with the power of God is, is crucial for us to flourish in 2024. The joy is our strength, guys. Be strengthened with all might. By His glorious power, because His power has raised Jesus from the dead. The power of the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, and He's going to be with us if we ask Him. But you know where power or where strength really comes in is where we realize that we are weak. And I believe this year we need to say, Lord, for me to be strengthened, I need to, be re I need to realize that I'm weak. Because if I'm strong in myself, if I think I'm strong and I think I'm going to stand, well, then God will leave you to stand on your own strength. But he will be waiting there when you realize, okay, I've reached the end of my strength. Lord, your strength is made perfect in my weakness because actually I'm weak. So for, for us to flourish in 2024, we need to be at that place of such dependence and such humility saying, God, I, I can't. I can't do all these things that, that Colossians talks here about. It, it's, it's difficult. But Lord, I need your strength. And that I can have joy in persecution, have joy in suffering, have joy in challenges, 
that I can have patience to allow your good work to have its way in my life and around my life. So let's surrender this year. Let's, let's say, God, I want to be strengthened with your might and with your power, but it comes at that place where I'm really desperate. I'm, I'm absolutely, absolutely weak without you. And then the last one, we ended this last year. We said, let's give thanks to the Lord. Paul ends and he says, I pray that you will give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to be partakers of the saints of the inheritance of the saints in his light. We need to be thankful for our salvation first and foremost. The fact that we are children of God, the fact that we are called saints. You know what, guys? We have an inheritance. There's an inheritance in heaven waiting for us. But there's also an inheritance on earth. There's people's lives that we can impact. There's an inheritance, a kingdom inheritance that we can walk into this year. But let's start by giving thanks to the Father. Let's start by being thankful that we're children of God. But then just, you know what? Let's continue this year to be thankful and let's never stop being thankful. That's a key to flourish and to grow in 2024 is to be thankful. You know, thanksgiving unlocks so much. You know, when you start to pray and you start by thanksgiving, you will just see how God just flows through you. This morning we had friends that were staying over with us from East London. They were going to come to church this morning, but they left. But I just started to, I just wanted to pray a quick prayer for them. But then it was their whole family there and they were standing. And then I just started to thank the Lord for each one of them. And as I was thanking the Lord for them as a family, I just prayed for each one of them. It just flowed like that. And it was such a blessing seeing them being blessed. I was blessed. And, And you know, every time I start to pray for someone, I start by thanking thanking God for this person by giving thanks. And what it does, it unlocks prophetic words. It unlocks the flow of the Spirit when you start by saying, thank you for Caitlin. Thank you for Matthew. Thank you for Rudy. Thank you for Alicia. Thank you. Lord, I thank you for Paul there. I thank you for, and you know, when you start to do that, you say, yo, thank you for this word this year. Thank you for the, the, the fruit that's gonna come in this life. You say, you say thanks for the person, and you know what? You start to just flow in what God has for this person. You just love this person more and you want to pray more and you want to, want to praise God more for whatever you're thanking him for. If you start to pray for the city, you start by thanking him for the city. And then when you thank him for PE, you realize, oh, look at the awesome potential in this city. Thank you, God. Unlock this potential. Unlock the last year, Lord. There's, there's last year, but they're going to be saved. But you say thanks to God and you pray out of that place of abundance, not out of a place of lack. Thanksgiving is, is a place where God has done it all. We just need to unlock it and release it and, and access it. Amen. So if Thanksgiving can be a key to your life and my life this year, we are going to flourish. But it needs to be added on to the fact that we are being filled with His power, that we are weak and we need to be strengthened. And that needs to be added on to the fact that we are pleasing God. We are walking fully in Him. We are bearing fruit. We are increasing in the knowledge of God. And that needs to be added on to the most important part of the puzzle, to know the will of God. Because when you know the will of God, when you're filled with the knowledge of the will of God, you know what? You are powerful. You make a difference. You flourish because you're walking confidently in that world. And he's with you and he's empowering you and he's welling up inside of you a fountain of living waters where you can't stop giving thanks for the beautiful work God is doing in and through your life. So who is willing to trust the Lord and say, God, I surrender. I want to do and live this life that you've called me to live. I want to be strengthened. I want to walk in all the fullness. I want to to pray to God. I want to be connected to God all the time. Knowing his will, submitting under him, being strengthened, being worthy of him, bearing fruit, continuing with his strength and surrendering and giving thanks. And you know what? That thanksgiving just unlocks more of the will of God. I believe it's a cycle that just continues. As you give thanks, you see more of God's will. God shows you more because God's not going to give his full will to you for your life in this year. He's going to reveal to you that which you are wanting to walk in, that which you are wanting to receive, that which you are being faithful in. 
And I want to challenge you and encourage you if you need to do business with the Lord, if there's unfinished stuff from last year, be obedient. Do that which God has told you last year. Don't wait for a new word. If you haven't been obedient to last year's prophetic word of your life, then go back to that, finish that, and God will unlock the prophetic for 2024. But he's not going to keep giving you new words if he can't trust you with what he's already given you. And maybe you need to go back and say, Lord, thank you for my salvation. Thank you for why you called me. Thank you for why you saved me. I want to know your will for my life. But it always includes the gospel. It always includes reaching other people. It always includes letting God's kingdom come. That is the will of God. One of his wills is that all men are saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God's will for your life will always include other people. Because it's not just about us, guys. It's all about him. But he wants to reach people. And he wants us to be equipped in the word of God. And I trust that you, that you were equipped and blessed by, by just the short study of, of the book of Colossians. Read it more this week. Go through it. Say, God, reveal to me those words that stick out like the walk, the worthy, the will, the knowledge. Because I don't want earthly knowledge. I don't want to be filled with studying the whole time. I want to live out knowledge. Is, and, and he talks here about wisdom. He says, I want you to apply this wisdom. It's not just knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but... Love builds up, the Bible says. So apply that knowledge. Have that wisdom and knowledge, but live it out. Share it with other people. And you're going to be blessed in 2024. Amen. Let's hand out the communion elements. I want us to take communion as a, as a body this morning and just commit our ways to the Lord and say, Lord, help me, Jesus. I need you. I need your Holy Spirit. And I need others in this church. Seek someone else in this church that you can walk with, amen? It's not bad to have accountability and people outside of this church, but, but let's, let's grow closer to one another in this body. If you've been called to show for PE, draw near to someone, say, let's walk together. Let's go through the book of Colossians together. Let's overflow together in Jesus Christ, amen? Let's give thanks together. Let's pray together. So maybe some of you need to just have someone that's praying for you every week and with you. Let's just gather for 15 minutes or 20 minutes before work or before the day starts or sometime in the week and pray with one another. We've got a, a men's group going on a Monday morning, some of us, and I really want to this year maybe even open it up to everyone in the church. But it's wonderful where we walk with each other and I can see the relationships growing. I can see what God is doing. But be part of a life group. Be part of a group where you can give thanks together with others. You can seek the will of God together. You can challenge one another to walk in the calling on your life. And 2024 will be a year of overflowing. Amen. So to sum up, how to overflow this year, know the will of God. But for your life, ask God, what is the specific will for your life? Walk worthy of him. When you fall, fall forward. Yes, we're going to make mistakes this year. We're going to sometimes displease God. But you know what? He's okay. He's, he's, he's made a provision to forgive you. <clears throat> to forgive you. Walk worthy of Him. And then be strengthened by Him. Come to the end of yourself. <clears throat> you know, when you, when you try to walk worthy of the Lord in your own strength, you realize you are so weak. Then you say, Holy Spirit, here I am. Help me. I, I want to be filled with you again. And then continue to give thanks. And know that if you make a mistake, you're not a sinner. You're just a saint who's making a mistake. You're not a, if you're born again this morning, if you're saved, yeah, and that's why I made the altar call at the beginning. I trust that each one of us know that we're born again. I want to say to you this morning, there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> some, some, you, some of you need to receive that this morning. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I think you need to repeat that after me. There's no condemnation. Say this. There's no condemnation. <clears throat> because I'm in Christ. I'm a saint. and not a sinner. You see, if you see yourself as a sinner this year, you're going to sin in faith. You're just going to keep sinning, right? But if you see yourself as a saint who, who needs sanctification, yes, you make mistakes. Yes, you won't be perfect. But you're a saint. And you are going to fall forward. So when you make a mistake, run to Jesus straight away. Don't let shame and guilt come across 
your path. Don't let any barriers come between you and Jesus. Amen. So when you walk worthy of him, fall forward. Go run toward him. Be strengthened by him. Surrender and say, Lord, I cannot in my own strength. And I'm going to give you thanks that I am a saint. I have the inheritance of the saints in the light. I walk in the light this year. And don't let people lie to you. Don't let the devil lie to you. But you just make sure you don't lie to other people either. (laughs) Because he says, stop lying. Put away lying. Put on the flesh. I mean, put on the spirit. Put away the flesh. So I'm going to pray for all of us this year. I trust that you will all flourish in the will of God for this year. Amen. That you will know the will of God, that you'll be filled to the place of overflowing. Because who's the fullness of God? Jesus himself. He's the fullness of God. He fills all in all. He wants to fill each one of you with more of him. Amen. So be an empty vessel this morning and say, Lord, I want to empty myself of the word, the world And everything else, I want to fill myself up with you, Lord. You are all. The gospel is all. I want to be filled with your will, God. I want to walk in your will. I want to live worthy of you, pleasing you. I want to be thankful and I want to be strengthened with your power, Lord. I want to walk in all the miracles that you want me to walk in this year. And you are a miracle. You already are a living miracle. The fact that you've come to Jesus and said, yeah, I am, Lord, use me. Thanks. Let's pray together. Lord, I want to thank you this morning for your will for our lives. Thank you for the gospel, God. Thank you for this book of Colossians, which challenges us. Do not add anything else, Lord, but to say, Christ Jesus, you are all in all. You fill all in all. You are the fullness of God. And you fill us with your knowledge, the knowledge of your will, God. And Lord, as we grow in this, help us to grow in the knowledge of you, Lord. Help us to be fully surrendered vessels, walking worthy of you, living in the fullness and the thanksgiving of what your kingdom has done in our lives. And thank you that we can be a testimony this year, Lord, as we overflow like the Kocha Dam. Lord, help us to overflow that we can reach many others this year, that we can be so filled with your word, that we can let the word of God dwell in us richly this year, this year, Lord, that we can teach others, that we can encourage others, admonish others, Lord. And even to those who are outside, Lord, that we walk, walk wisely And carefully with those who are are not believing the same as us, Lord, help us to love them and to spread your good news to the point where they cannot resist your love and your goodness. So, Lord, fill us up this morning. God, fill us up for this year that we will not burn out next year, Lord, or or at the end of this year, that we will not walk away from you, that, that we will not get fatigued and tired. But, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, we say, yeah, we are. Fill us, Lord strengthen us, give us the joy of the Lord throughout this year. Give us your presence, Lord. Help us to remember your presence is with us. Help us to practice your presence by praying, by thanking you, by just connecting with you, Lord. And for those who don't know your will for their lives specifically, I thank you that you'll reveal it as they seek you, Lord. As Paul is praying for these guys, Lord, I know you, Jesus, are praying for all of us. And my prayer also is for our church, for each one here this morning, to be filled with the knowledge of the will of God. So I want to pray that right now over each one of you. I'm going I'm to change the scripture a little bit now. I'm going to pray this over you. So just receive this before we take communion and we thank God. Lord, today... I want to pray like Paul over Shofar PE, that each one in this church will be filled with the knowledge of the will of God in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Lord, I pray that each of these precious people, myself included, would walk worthy of you this year, that each one of us would fully please you that each one would be fruitful in every good work and that they would increase in the knowledge of God. Lord, I pray that they would be strengthened with all might according to your glorious power. Lord, that all patience and long-suffering and joy that is needed, they would be filled with that. Lord, and I pray that they would give thanks to you, Father God, who has qualified each one of us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. 
I pray that in Jesus' name, that it will be a reality for each one in this church and each one that is going to come into this church this year, Lord. I see so many people coming in to receive this prayer and to receive this blessing, that they would walk in here knowing the will of God. They would walk in, walk in, walk in here and be changed. They would walk worthy of you, not walk according to the world, that they would be strengthened with your spirit as they come into this church and that there would be a people of thanksgiving. So, Lord, we thank you this morning for your blood and your body. Thank you, Lord, for the sacraments of communion. At the beginning of this year, we consecrate this year to you. 2024 is yours, Lord. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom come in and through our lives. I want you to take communion with someone special in your life, whether it's your spouse or a friend. Let's, let's take communion together. So take the body and the blood of Jesus. It's been prayed over already. You just pray over the person next to you now. So no one's standing alone, guys. Let's find some of those who are alone. Find someone else. Let's not be alone. Let's take communion. Let's bless that person that you're with and, and pray a prophetic word over that person, okay? So let's trust the Lord to unlock what I've been preaching about this morning in that person's life. Pray over them. Bless them. Take communion together. If we can just play some music, Justin would be awesome. Play some background music and then let's pray together, guys, and bless each other and let 2024 be a year of overflowing. Amen? A year of joy, a year of strength, a year of God's will being done in and through our lives, a year that the gospel would go out with power in Jesus' name. So let's pray together. God bless you guys as you minister to one another.
Guys, have a blessed Sunday. Thank you so much for coming. Come again next week. Bring some friends and enjoy this awesome Sunday. And all the best for those who are going back to work on Monday, tomorrow. Who's going back to work tomorrow? Some of you. But may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you as you start again, as you get the machine going. But remember, walk in the Spirit. Don't let the pressures of this world take you away from the place of rest in the Lord. But be blessed and have an overflowing 2024 for all of us. Amen.